and welcome to episode 153 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. In Napa Valley, about to be hot in Napa Valley. It's about to be blazing up here, but in the heat sense. <laughs> yeah. Don't say blazing in Napa because that tends to mean other things. Just temperature. It'll be 100 here tomorrow, so Ugh. it'll be great. Ugh. Well, at that is, I presume, quite a bit steamier than where you've just been. Well, and you as well, since we've obviously taken a couple of weeks off here as both of us were traveling. Mm-hmm. I was in Ireland, which I can tell you right now has inspired my drink of choice, which <laughs> obviously had to be Guinness <laughs> since I drank a lot of those in Ireland and I've kept on drinking them since I've come back home. That's lovely. That's Ireland thing. has also inspired my drinking. But I'm drinking a slightly different drink. I'm I'm going for something you actually recommended. It's called a Tuborg. It's a beer um, that I think comes from Denmark. Tell me. Inform me. Uh, it's Danish. Yeah, it's just north of Copenhagen. There you go. Uh, which is where I kind of started my adventure. Yeah, you visited far more countries than me. I went to Ireland, came back. I, I think I hit seven, maybe. Nice. I lost. I lost track in Prague. Um, but that's apparently what Prague will do. So there you go. No, I lost track in Berlin. Is that a thing where it's like what happens in Prague stays in Prague? Mm, I hope what happened in Berlin stays in Berlin. Uh, but Good. that was before Prague. So who knows where I left things. But I Historically, had... that hasn't always been the case. Mm. So let's hope it is this time. Yep. Yep. No, just uh, regrets and children. They're all in Europe. So, I will say this: my parents were uh, were kind enough to come and join me in Vienna near the end of the trip. And I told you this before: my mom drugged my dad all the way to Vienna so that she could ride on a train from Vienna to Bratislava to Budapest. That uh, is a long flight for a four-hour train ride. Yeah, can't she just take Amtrak? She's a sucker for a train. I don't know, I, d- dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, d- I dare you to get your mind around hers. Good luck. But we had well, we had a really nice time. Uh, I took her to the opera. Um, my dad, my dad walked out where I was in this Airbnb, and my dad walked out in what had to be the stiffest jeans I've ever seen, and said, "Is this uh, fancy enough?" And I, <laughs> I said, "What happened to your pants?" And he goes, "Your mother ironed them." They starched them. Jesus. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to break first, those jeans or your femurs. But we we went to the opera. He made it. See, you had a really highbrow kind of experience. I just went to a lot of pubs. Well, that was, my parents showed up. It it elevated. But before that, no, it was, uh, yeah, it was dirty. Excellent. Well, let's get on with the show here. I could talk about Ireland quite a bit. It was a great place. If any of you have ever, you know, had the travel bug and you haven't been to Ireland, go. Fantastic country. The people are awesome. They are so friendly. Favorite spot? While Favorite spot yeah, was uh, Galway. Galway? Mine too. Galway. Had the most fun there. Was in Dublin, Killarney, Cork, uh, some other places. Did a lot of driving. But the town of Galway, I can actually see myself hanging out there for a long time if ever. It was required. What's a long time in your mind? Like six, eight months, something oh, like that. That is, oof, it's a life. But yeah, I love. I mean, I love Galway, man. Did you get? You got down south too, right? Like Middleton, Cork. Yeah, I was yeah. down in Killarney and then Cork. I don't love Cork so much. It's very industrial, even though it's a college town. Killarney's small, but right next to the national park, so it's really cool. And obviously, with my last name, you can tell that I'm really in the homeland. <laughs> So I went through the old village of Kaloran, which was kind of cool. Did you, uh, but did along you the way, do the thing that we've always talked about, which is get a free drink? No, because that pub is not in that town. It is in a different town, and we did not go through that town this time. But I stopped in the Kaloran graveyard, so that's always interesting. <laughs> I saw your future, did you? All right. <laughs> well, everybody's got the same future, so I suppose so, right? Yeah, we're all heading that way. And taxes. Tell me about the song well, you picked so I can change the subject as quick as possible. Yes. Because this makes me please, deeply uncomfortable. 
You want to talk about graves some more? Uh-huh. Um, I mean, that's the most notable feature of the whole town. <laughs> but while I was on that trip, uh, I actually went back and revisited a bunch of music from years past by bands that I didn't really like when I first heard it. Yeah. So like a great example is R.E.M. I'm mm-hmm. not an R.E.M. fan. Went back and listened to some of their songs and I was like, all right, I found some of the stuff in there that I like. But another band I went back and listened to fairly closely was Jane's Addiction. I never really liked Perry Farrell. Honestly, I thought he was kind of a poser. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to go back and listen to it. And I, I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. Uh, but in particular, one of the songs really resonated with me because the song is the first song off their second album, which is Ritual De Lo Habitual. And the song is called Stop. And the reason it resonated with me for the June LSAT is this is it. This is the logic game stop. Uh, that's a heartbreak. There's, your, tra- <laughs> there's your transition. It's a heartbreak. <laughs> You know, I never really liked Dave Navarro. I didn't. Uh, I didn't think he had enough piercings. But, <laughs> but he I didn't did, like tattoos uh, enough. Yeah. I did like Jane's <laughs> Addiction, so I'm glad you picked this song. This is a pretty good one. So good on you, man. And here we go. Interesting I mean, band. Let's let's move right into the all set world because my God, there's one looming. Yeah, and I think uh, probably we'll preface this by saying we're going to keep this episode short aside from the lengthy European conversation, uh, which hopefully most of you just fast forwarded through, yeah. uh, simply because the June LSAT is this week, starts on Wednesday. So John, why don't you run down all the tests and what we're looking at here? Sure. So the June test starts, I, I guess when this releases, it'll be tomorrow. But as of today, it's in two days. Uh, we missed the registration. So if you're not signed up for June, you'll never get to see a Logic game. Uh, it ended on April 23rd, I believe. They did add a day to this test because it's, as we're going to talk about in just a second, it's kind of enormous. There's a bunch of people signed up for this test, which is no huge surprise. I mean, it's, it's as the song suggests, it's the last one where if you're good at logic games, this is it. Um, in fact, it's so big that you and I did what is kind of become a, a special thing, which is we did a crystal mini ball uh, for specifically for this test. It's available on our website. You can go and sign up for it. If you can't find that, you can message me on Reddit and we'll give you a a website at the end of this too, which you can um, email us on. And then of course, the first of the new test formats is August. Registration for that is open now. Uh, It's going to run August 7th, which is a Wednesday through August 10th, which is a Saturday. Uh, And scores will release for that test on uh, August 28th. Scores for the June test will come out on the 26th of June. And we've completely revamped our course offerings specifically for what happens in August and beyond, which is kind of cool. I don't know if you want to talk about that. I mean, you're involved. I'm certainly involved. We're both involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because you and I have just watched something happen over the last month that um, is bittersweet, which is... The courses that we had originally created for the LSAT that included Logic Games, they're what we can now call the legacy courses. But those have slowly, we've stopped offering them. Mm -hmm. You can no longer sign up for them. Now, if you're in a course, obviously it continues running, all that kind of good stuff. We didn't stop the course. But those legacy courses are now no longer available. So when you go to the website, your only option are to sign up for the new format, just LR and RC tests right. that uh, will appear for August and later. Uh, and they opened up the registration for those, John, actually, while you and I were both out of the country. <laughs> so classic. I got there and I was scrambling on my phone internationally to uh, post the information that uh, the registration was now open. But you can take any LSAT from the 24-25 cycle, which goes through June of 2025, and register for that. Now they've put up all the the availability and all that kind of good stuff. So that is out and about into the public. And once this June test ends here, and obviously over the next four days, the Wednesday through Saturday, John, you and I'll be watching this very carefully. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking to students, kind of getting test reports, taking a look at things and then collating that all. We'll do another podcast. Um, I don't know if we'll do it Sunday night or Monday night and release it the following day, but then we'll recap all the content talk a little bit about how things played out with the crystal ball predictions and so forth. What we normally do for every test, we're not changing anything about that just because this is the last logic games test. I assume it'll be roughly a week from right now. Yeah. I would think you're about right there. No, say that again. Say that again. Can I say you're right. 
I know it happens so rarely that you need me to reinforce it for you when it does happen, so I'm happy to do that. John, you were right in this case. Oh, my God. Well done. Oh, my God. Good boy. Memorialize this date. Um, (laughs) Don't mess with me. (laughs) I'll slash and burn you. I know. It stings so good. But (laughs) we actually have uh, a couple of webinars that are coming up that will apply to the August test and beyond. There's one on June 12th, which is about parallel reasoning questions in logical reasoning You can expect to see with two logical reasoning sections, probably four of those. That's a big percentage of your score. So that's a really important webinar to attend, especially for a question type that can take a lot of your time. And then we have another one on June 26th that actually addresses the nature of the new test, the format we call the LSAT 101. It's really, especially if you're kind of new to this, it's a really important thing to to just get your head around how the new test is going to work. Yeah, if you think about those parallel questions, it's 8% of the scored LR sections, but most people consider it to take more time than 8%. Yeah. yeah. So there are tricks and tips, I think, that are really cool to slice through those questions. So if you are taking uh, the August test or later, that is one of the places that would actually start to be like, does test prep help? Okay, let's take a look at how we can break these questions down, because I think that's one of the great proof areas that yeah. says, oh, there is stuff that I can learn about this. There are ways to navigate these questions to go faster and to feel more comfortable with them. And as you know, John, I rarely push webinars as like, ah, you know, this is the be all end all. But that is actually one of my favorite ones. And then honestly, after this June test drops off, you'll see a couple more webinars in July. There's an RC webinar, for example, coming up. Uh, Right now, they're not populated really into the system that easily, but they will start to appear. So there's many more beyond just the two that he's talking about there. However, do attend those too. They're free. They're helpful. (laughs) And whatever whatever happens beyond June, happens beyond June. They're coming. Uh, They're coming. I'm sure probably next week when we do this, we'll actually add those two to the roster. Yeah, I think that's a good time for it. And run them down. But let's move on to the just some of the questions that we've gotten. And we kind of made an interesting choice here, John. Mm-hmm. Uh, we said, let's not get really specific with like these, you know, highly contextual scenarios with all this background information. Uh, again, it's a short week in our minds because of the LSAT coming up. Let's instead do kind of like big picture overview questions. Address a few things from like how the cycle's looking. Talk a little bit about the June LSAT, anything that we've seen that has changed in terms of, uh, you know, predictions, our thoughts yeah. about it. Make a few comments about the August LSAT, maybe a comment or two about applications, and then keep this short and get out of here. I think everyone can be appreciative of that. And honestly, I think if we if we drug this out, it would be distracting. So we're trying to keep yeah. people's focus on the, uh, the matter at hand. Yeah, let's do that. Keep focused as well as, you know, hopefully provide a little diversion here. But we're we're reaching the end of the cycle. You know, the technical cycle that LSAT goes through is, it's interesting. It goes from July 1st to June 30th from an LSAT standpoint, but the application cycle actually rolls through July into about the first week of August, because that's when law schools are starting to finalize things. And so at this point, we are deep, deep into the cycle itself, well past 90%. And so I'll just kind of give a very brief overview. And I posted some stats on this on Twitter earlier, and I'm not going to reread those. But I can tell you that at this point in the year, what we're seeing is that applicants are up 5.3% compared to last year. So the first thing to understand is there are more people competing for what is typically a relatively fixed amount of spaces. I say relatively because it does move a little bit from school to school as they change policies and they get, you know, yields that are a little bit different. So just be aware of that. There's more people competing throughout this year for positions starting this particular fall. However, when we start breaking down what's happening with LSAT scores, it is not exactly the same. Like you'd expect to see roughly that type of increase across all score bands if it was equally distributed. Right. It is not. In fact, it's really kind of inverted in a weird way. At the very top, the number of high scores is down last year. So it actually compounds this kind of like interesting scenario where you have more people, but overall fewer high scores. Yeah. And high, this high you mean 170 plus. Yeah. I'll break the stats down in just All a right. second. But the really high scores in the 170s, there are fewer of them this year than last year, even though there are more applicants. And I know a lot of people in April were like, April screwed the whole thing up. 
No, actually, April narrowed the gap. Yeah. It was worse before April. It produced more scores in the 170s than the prior tests had done relatively from the looks of it. But if you look at the scores, say 175 to 180, there's 1.5% fewer scores Good. up there. And that only adds up to about 20, 25 scores overall. But if you look at 170 to 174, it's down 1.7%. Yeah. Percent. So those scores are down. It's in the 160s that you see the big ballooning in the 150s. Um, 165 and 169 is up 4.3%. 160 to 164 is up 7.8%. 155 to 159 is up 5.7%. And then 150 to 154 matches the, the applicant increase at 5.3%. So we've seen more scores in the 160s, fewer scores in the 170s, which probably means that if you look at the T14, and you think about all those medians that they have in the 170s, those probably aren't increasing. I think they'll do their best to kind of maintain the standard. Yeah, I agree. But if any school has a median in the 160s, they're going to be looking to increase it this year, whether that's their 75th, 50th, or 25th median, depending upon the school. That's probably what your expectation should be. So if you're looking at a T14 or you know a T25 and they've got a median that's, say, 167, it probably will be 168 this upcoming year. That's what they'll be shooting for, at least. That'll, that's what they'll be targeting. Well, Dave, congratulations. You just anticipated every question I was going to ask you uh, <laughs> as to what this should mean for people. A 5.3% in applicants increase sounds scary, but when you consider where that increase is actually hit in terms of score bands, there are people that are going to be more harmed and there are people going to probably be benefited if, if you can score under the 170s this is a good year for you yeah I mean, it was actually beneficial for you overall uh and again you know this is a kind of an odd distribution of increases and decreases and i've said this before i'm not going to get into a conspiracy theory about it but oh, i wonder if this is on, <laughs> not what the, the percentiles are going to look like next year if we start uh, to see a little bit of a decrease in the 170s and we see a lot of a lot of zero even kind of uh, percent changes next year and same in the 160s. Yeah. Maybe fat in the middle up, so to speak, of the uh, the typical bell curve that these scores are supposed to live on, but don't really live on. Not really. And that's too bad because I really want to um, get conspiratorial. I know you Fine. do, and it's fun to do that. Fine. But we're not going to. I know. I, will, I won't do it until we actually see the numbers. They will be interesting. That's all I'll say. That's my conspiracy. Yeah, agreed. All right. And on that note, let's move to June. We got about a day before this thing kicks off. Let's talk about it. And I, I hesitate to ask this as the first question, but I'm going to, which is, what do you think at this point would be a, a trigger or a warning sign, something that would tell someone that June's a bad idea, or maybe I should phrase that differently, something that should tell someone that a better idea would be to wait. And literally to take or delay. Yeah. Yeah. So where, right. where do you draw that line? How do you know where the scales tip? It's a good question. And it probably would be easy to go in a negative way with this, but <laughs> let's try to avoid well, that. I appreciate you steering it, me back into the positive because I don't think I did a great job. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's talk about some of the factors here that, uh, you know, kind of like trigger this decision. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that I think come up in, in kind of like the decision matrix that somebody would make. I mean, the first thing is, is, you know, if you're looking at this and you're thinking, all right, I'm scoring about where I was, you know, I'm scoring on practice tests yeah. and I feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. There's no real reason to hesitate or delay. Okay. You know, if, you're, if your practice test performance is where you want it to be for the schools that you want to get into, move forward yeah, with it. Full speed ahead. If, yeah. If you're sitting in a situation where you are below where you know you have to be or really want to be, that's when it starts creeping into that you need to think about whether or not you want to take this test. Um, I've said it on prior podcasts that the idea of the Hail Mary, the miracle <laughs> that happens on the day of the exam yeah. where suddenly you jump 10 points, it's insanely rare. Yeah. You know, the, we're talking the one in a million. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't really happen. And so if you're relying upon hope, that is not actually a valid way to approach it. That's the situation where I would start thinking to myself, hey, I, I might want to delay this. 
if you're only taking this test because well it's got logic games and i know those and i and i don't know what the new test format is that's not a valid reason to take this exam at the same time sometimes people get nervous or a little bit anxious about the test and they think to themselves I'm, you know i'm scared i don't mm -hmm. want to take it and the comment i always make to that is that's never going to go away <laughs> You are always going to have some degree of anxiety, some degree of fear about the test. And so don't use that as the reason not to take this. And I'll, we'll address this more in a second, yeah. but instead use your scoring history with this exam and your general feeling. But honestly, if you feel like there's more you can do to score better on the exam, postpone it. If you like where you're at, take it. Interesting. I, I like that you've made that sort of quantifiable and objective because i think so many people do treat this emotionally they they see it as a subjective thing as to how i feel but you actually can measure what the likelihood is going to be you, nothing's perfect as a predictor but if you take practice tests that are recent and you do them under real test conditions that's as good as you're going to get in terms of what to actually expect and if that's going the way that you hope if that's actually satisfying you in terms of what your your objectives are, your outcomes are, are meant to be, go for it. Take it. Yeah. And if you're yeah. not there yet, that's okay too. It's, it's really hard, I think, sometimes to tell people that there's no rush because everything with this feels <laughs> hurried. It does. Um, uh -huh. But the wait is worth it if the score if the potential is there. And I have to remind people of this a lot. But if you're there, or at least nearly there, roughly where you want to be, then this is your week. Go for it. Yeah. And let's come back to the, the mental aspect of, of, of fear or anxiety or worry. Because I didn't want to just throw that out there and then not say anything about That's it. Fair. Because I actually think this is a really important part of this. Um, and I'm not saying people can't overcome their fears when I say it's always going to be there. Right. Part of what I'm driving at is that there's no test taker that I know that doesn't go in without some type of anxiety. Yeah. Different levels, obviously. But I can tell you that if I was to sit down for the June LSAT, I have butterflies. Yeah. The, the, that's, that's something I expect to be the case. So I'm not worried about it. Do I enjoy it? Not really. You know, I don't, I don't want any nerves about anything, <laughs> but you're going to have them because you're putting yourself under the microscope. The spotlights are on, you know, that it is a performance that counts. Yeah. So the question is, is what do you do with that anxiety? For me, I try to use that to become more focused and to move faster and to use that, what I consider really like nervous energy yeah. in my system to some kind of good or positive effect, as opposed to allowing it to cloud or distract me. Uh. So I don't think it's going to go away. So I often tell people, it's like your concern about the LSAT is probably not going to materially change whether you take it in June or August or September or what have you. The question is, is can you use it to your advantage? Yeah. But it's more about preparation. Yeah. If you feel prepared, go for it. Well, I love that you phrased it as nervous energy because that gives you the choice of which of those two words you want to focus on. To me, uh -huh. it's the energy. It's it's something charged it's something that can actually help you if you just find a way to channel it to funnel it and frankly the fact that i care is first of all unusual but second of all it's something that i feel like i can use i care about this that's going to help me if i just find a way to harness it yeah i kind of liken it to doing public speaking mm -hmm. And I've, you know, you and I have both spoken to large crowds before and there's a going into a class of 20 isn't that big of a deal. 30, that's not that much, but I've spoken to crowds of over 500 before. Sure. And I know you have too. And it's like, that's a different level. Like I know at that point, it's like, there's a lot more eyes on me and what I'm saying and what I've always been able to do in those situations. And I've been nervous in every single one. There's always like that kind of undercurrent is use it to hype the performance. Yeah you know, to jazz it up and be like, all right, now, you know, let's put the extra energy, not jazz hands, jazz gonna, fingers. You and your tab not, shoes. Not like that, man. 
<laughs> this isn't bring it on. Uh, it is uh, <laughs> much more the idea of like, all right, it's almost like that bounciness that you yeah. see in football players or basketball players before the game starts. They're trying to loosen up. They're bouncing. They're using that energy. That's kind of how I look at test taking. Even though you're sitting there in a chair and it doesn't have that physicality, your mind still has that physicality yeah. aspect. And that's where I'm driving out yeah, with this. I, we don't need to get too deep into the, the mentality thing because you and I have done it already. But I'm 100% with you, man. When I go to take a test like this, when I do anything that might have a consequence, I'm, I mean, literally vibrating. But I see it as excitement. I see it as like an opportunity. And I, I wish more people understood the, the opportunity aspect of this because... All you have to be is just better than other people. It's not that tough. Just so, just get more questions right. <laughs> that's, that's sort of a glib thing. I know you're joking. I know. I that actually brings up an interesting question because, you know, you move into the last few days before the test. Right. There's different ways to approach this in, in terms of how people spend their time. And so if you're coming up on this exam, you got one, two, three, four days beforehand. What are some of the things that you might do or not do in the last few days? Here? Mm. Well, I, I don't know that I'm a role model necessarily in this, um, but the thing that I would focus most on, depending again on how much time I had, if I had four days, I might still try to learn some things. If I had one day, what I would be focused on is purely mental and entirely confidence. Just this, I mean, almost unassailable bulletproof sense of I'm going to crush this. Nothing yep. can happen that's not going to be the best, like the best day of my life. That's how I tend to look at these things. I'm 10 feet tall. I'm smarter than the people who write this. That's what I can't, like, con I, I'm trying to find a way to say this without me sounding like kind of a dick. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is you kind of need to be. You kind of need to go into this with this sort of narcissism. Yeah. The word I would have used there is arrogant. Okay. But All right. I think what I would have added to is there is a moment for necessary arrogance. Yeah, that's much better than I said it. This is it. <laughs> this is the moment where you need to start believing in yourself to the exclusion of others yeah. and perhaps at the expense of others that indeed you do have the talent and the capability. Yeah. You know, that the, the 10 feet tall kind of reference you make is I think harkens back to one that I've made before is yeah. like when I walk into the test center, I'm a hundred feet tall. Yeah. Everybody's an ant. The test is an ant. Yeah. Yeah. This is the old days when you, you know, you had like a hundred people in the room. I was like, I don't see anybody. I only see the test and me. And part of the question here, John is, is what's the preparation point to get to that kind of like necessary areas? I think you and I have different approaches to this. I'm certain that we do. I, I, I want to add one thing because you said kind of to the expense of you know, other people or whatever, but even to the expense of reality on some level. And I, Fair enough. Yeah. I, I think you almost need to hype yourself up to the point where you're just like, what was that guy's name on American Idol or whatever? Sindaya? What was that guy's name? Have the confidence of that terrible singer who somehow made it through. That's the way that I tend to think of this is I am, I am unbelievably good. Paul Abdul is back there just clapping. That's how I tend to, to see myself. And it doesn't have to be real. It just has to be real for you. Does that make sense? So you got to be your own hype man. Exactly. Yeah. I get, you know, the, Ameri the American <laughs> I Idol reference. Dated my, dated my, so Randy Jackson's <laughs> back there like, my dog, get it. Uh, yeah, now you are. Um, <laughs> I think the, the point though is, is that you, you want to get to that your approach, if I recall from the past, yeah. is that you will not just talk to yourself that way, but you will also do questions and you will go back and put yourself in a position where you're like, hey, I've done this before. 100%. I annihilated yeah, yeah, that yeah. question. I, I try to marry it to some sort of experience or some sort of history. So for me, even in the day or two leading up to the test and certainly the morning of, I like to warm up and I like to do it in a way that reminds me of how good I can be at this because that means I can do it again. The test doesn't change, which means neither do I. I've done it once. I could do it again. If I was perfect at a game, if I went through a reading comp passage and felt absolute clarity or some logical reasoning questions that were tricky, but I cracked them, I can do it again. So I try to revisit those moments. 
and I do it with yeah, actual you said content. That. Yeah, you've said that before that in the in you know on the day of the test, you're more oh, yeah. likely to go back and, and glance at a few questions that you know that you did. I need well. to put my head like my head back in that space of just feeling like you're so good at this. Remember? Yeah. That's not the approach that I take. Although I think we end up in the same space and the intent is the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. What's I yours? usually don't go back. Yeah. On the day of the test, I don't look at questions. I feel at that point, I'm like, I've learned everything I need to know. And actually that is a point of confidence. Like mm. I am here. I understand this. I don't need to look at any further questions. Interesting. What I tend to do is a lot more visualization mm -hmm. and ideation of success. Okay. Seeing what I would, you know, how I might react if something came up, the first logic game, the first logical reasoning question, yeah. the first RC passage, what are the things I want to look for mentally? Almost like a checklist running through it and then seeing, yes, I got that. Yeah. You ever kind seen those Tour de France guys success. that like close their eyes and, and they actually ride the route in their head? I feel yeah, like you're that. Exactly. And for that. me, I would watch yeah. old videos of me pedaling. There you go. That's a great... I think analogy of of the two different approaches here. Neither one of them is better. It's what's important that what works for you as a test taker yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, John's wouldn't work as well for me, although I think it would certainly help. It wouldn't it wouldn't hurt me. Uh, I don't think my approach would work as well for him because that's just not how he's wired. That's okay. You just have to figure out which one of those or what third or yeah, fourth approach that you might personally mm -hmm. have would actually work there. And that actually kind of like ties into the idea of doing questions beforehand. Yeah. You mentioned like, you know, if you had like four days, three days, you probably would still look at some concepts and still work through new material. I would do the same. If it was the day before, I would imagine you would probably re lightly review questions. I'm less likely to do that. That makes sense. Yeah. The, the idea that I would look at anything new the day before, even two days before probably, that could potentially go wrong. And I think the odds of that are low, but... I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take that chance. I'm going to only do things that amp me up, that make me feel like an absolute giant. Agreed, and I think that's the best approach. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you and I come to the same outcome through slightly different avenues, um, but that's kind of cool. The fact that there are multiple ways to get to that destination, I think, is great. Gives everyone options mm -hmm. and there's no one size fits all. That's why you need to have these conversations is to work around it. Now, I'll have to say, John, that as, as the month has gone by here, since we did the crystal mini ball, mm -hmm. the one question that I've probably gotten is, is mostly about this June test, yeah. especially in the last few weeks has been not so much about like, what do I do in the last few days? But do we think <laughs> that anything has changed from our recommendations? Do we think that anything unusual is going to happen on this test? What's going to happen with logic games? Or is this just going to be another LSAT like all the others? Yeah. So let's address that. Well, I think I, I think I showed you this morning and I sent you a screenshot of my, I woke up to 28 Reddit messages and 26 of them were about, were about this. So yeah, this has been on my mind because clearly it's been on everyone else's. Is there anything, especially with this test that is kind of the last of I mean, geez, Dave, a, a generation, 91, you know, is there anything yeah. about this where we expect them to do something weird? Is there anything about the mini ball that we would change or redact or edit? My answer is no. You might feel differently, but I, I actually think we've still got it right. I think this is going to be another test like all of them up to this point pre-August. Yeah, so we know that the the June mini ball, if, if you're like, what is that? It's <laughs> still available on our website. You can get the link to it. They'll send it to you and uh, you can actually watch the video of it where we talk about what we're doing and, and the predictions we're making and, and to some extent why we make those predictions. But it's not like LSAC has released a, you know, a, a press release that says, hey, <laughs> we're actually going to do this. Yeah. So they haven't said anything. There'd be no expectation they would. So there's been nothing really that I've seen or that would suggest otherwise that yeah. what we said in that mini ball is going to change. So I'm actually on the same page with That's you. That's good. I think we're the press release. For, for in in a sense, it's... our press release is no change. Yeah. So the, the, the better question is, is I think the fear that people have is they're going to do something weird. Mm -hmm. It's the end of an era. Yeah. They're going to screw us. And I understand that fear because that's a natural fear of sure. like, uh, and most people don't like LSAC, so they're always thinking they're going to get screwed by them. Something that I, you know, can yeah, certainly yeah, yeah. understand as well. 
I'll point something out. You know, one of the things about the mini ball or any crystal ball is that we track test usages. And what are they doing these days? They are reusing tests that have been administered before. So they've been seen by thousands of people. Or they're putting together so-called new tests, which are based on experimental sections, which have also been tested with thousands of people. Yeah. So no matter what's happening here, the questions have appeared before. They've been vetted. They've been run through. I'm not seeing anything that says there's going to be anything wildly in impossible about this upcoming exam. It looks to me like it's going to just be another LSAT, another test that is business as usual. Does that mean there's going to be some hard RC? Yeah, probably. Is there probably going to be a hard logic game? Also, probably. Will there be some really tricky LR that annoy the hell out of you and have you waking up the next morning thinking, I should have chosen C? Yes, most likely. That's what's the case with every single LSAT. However, I'm not seeing anything that says there's going to be some kind of like end times LSAT <laughs> that's administered that's the hardest of all time. And I'm assuming, John, since you and I in the brief conversations we've had since we've both been back, haven't yeah. had a discussion that, that suggests that, that you're hearing about the same thing or thinking about the same yeah, thing. Yeah, no, I don't think they're going to go nuclear in June. Um, by the way, it's, it's funny that you mentioned C. C is definitely the, the answer for anyone listening to this who wonders, <laughs> definitely pick, definitely pick no. C. No, usually it's more like oh, D, crap. but that's a different right, conversation well. unless it's games and then it's A. <laughs> you would know that. Um, of course I would. <laughs> I do want to say this because I think you and I could probably recommend it on the off chance, and it is off, but on the off chance that something outlier-ish occurs... Give me your favorite game to prepare for it, because I know you have one and you've been recommending this and it has saved, I don't want to say lives, but you know. Yeah, the, um, you know, the question is, is, is there going to be an outlier game on right, this test? Right. Chances are no, but it is possible. Uh, and so when I look back at the outlier games that they have out there, especially the ones that we know that have been used before that are in play, Probably the one that continues to be the most likely to be emulated is that September 2016 virus game. Yeah. And that is a game that we know there are two kind of modeled games in in sections that are have been scored on prior LSATs that are floating around out there. And it's such a unique and unusual game that it's just useful to understand that. Yeah. And and I when I've been asked about this before, what I've said is, all right, let's imagine two scenarios. Number one, a game that's similar to that shows up you win, all right? <laughs> you now have the inside track on what would easily be the hardest game there and you have a way to, to attack it and solve it. Huge victory for you. All right, so that's scenario one. Scenario number two, they don't use it. Okay, all is not lost. First off, you didn't spend you know four days studying that game alone, so you didn't lose a huge amount of time. But more importantly to me, that game is very unique because of its unusual formation and the way it makes you think about logic games. You have to figure out how to start that game. That makes you think outside the box. That puts you in a position where if they do something weird on this June test, which I'm not really expecting, yes. you would then be in a position to have another method of attack or another angle to think about it. So you benefit in that way as well. So you're really not losing either way you go about it with that game. Just look at it. If it shows up, it's a fantastic day for all involved uh, who looked at it beforehand. If it doesn't, you still haven't lost anything and you might pick up something from that game that could help for other difficult type of games. That's such a good point. It's almost good to get the surprise out of your system. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah, I, I think that game is... To me, that game is, is so unusual, which isn't to say singular or unique. It's just weird. But it forces you to actually think. It forces you to be clever. And so much of this test in the weirdest uh, outlier fringe moments is just about your ability to be kind of agile, you know, nimble. That game so makes you do actually, it. That game totally makes you do it. So let's use that game right now as like a mini lesson uh -oh. in something that, no, no, I'm not going to ask you any questions <laughs> from it. Not that that would trouble you. It's C. <laughs> it's not C. Okay, stop saying that. It's typically D in reading comp and logical reasoning, and then especially at the end in logic games, A. So anyway, that's just basic guessing strategy, and all things are not independent. So if somebody's like, oh, it's just one in yeah. five, it's not. I've written about that's, this extensively. That's actually true. You're right. 
John, let's just imagine that you're the test taker and you're sitting down to take the virus game for the very first time. You've never seen it. Mm -hmm. You read it and you are stopped cold. Let's just imagine this happens. I don't have to imagine. Not for, yeah, well, I know, you know, everybody who reads that game for the first time is like, huh, that's unusual. Everybody stops for a few seconds. But let's just say it's not a few seconds. Let's say it's like, uh, you're worried now, like it's going to be 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds. What do you do? Well, again, you adjust, you pivot. I can tell you what I did. And it's like I say, it's, it's not a flattering memory. Um, not me at my best necessarily, although I came out, I came out okay. And I was proud of myself with, with how this turned out. But the first time I saw that game, it, it turned my head and I didn't quite know what to do. So I looked at the first question which described the game in kind of a linear fashion, one to another, to another virus. And that actually told me how the game was going to work. And then I looked at the second question, which asked which of the, I think, six variables, and there's five answers, could be the first virus or the first computer, in fact, whatever it was. And yeah. I, as soon as I saw that question, I said, there's my point. There's my entry point. Because it tells me the very first thing here has to be at one of these five. Maybe it's only one. Maybe there's a sixth, which would be two. But the first two questions in that game broke it wide open for me. And then it just laid down and it was easy. I don't mean easy, like, but it changed it so much in an accessibility sense. But I wouldn't normally go to the questions to try to figure out a game. But in that case, and again, not me at my best necessarily, it made my most like self aggrandizing, but it forced me to. But the fact that I was able to do that allowed that game to make sense. So to your question, I've taken you a long way to make a small point, which is huh. sometimes you have to think of other ways to gain access when things don't immediately click or feel familiar. And that's what it was for me. Yeah, I think if we if we summarize what you just said, please do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the action plan. Let's say this happens. You know, it doesn't even have to be the virus game, or I think one of the analog games is like about a data leak, yeah, uh, code, something like that. Let's just say that you hit a game and you're like, uh oh, I don't know. There's really two things that happen. Number one, take a moment. Mm -hmm. All right, there's no reason to freak out. You know that the, it is solvable. There are correct answers. It is something that can be figured out. All right. We know that's the case. It's not going to be just like, there is no right answer. So that's the first thing. So focus on that particular fact and kind of just like reigning in that moment. Second, if you really feel like I don't have a starting point on this, what John just said is exactly the right way to attack super difficult games. As, and that includes games like pattern games, uh, which this is really inside the family of. Go look at the questions. Yeah. Questions tell you how the test makers see it. They can give you little clues. So if you're if you read it and you don't have an immediate answer and you're like, I don't know what to do, go gain additional information. You don't even necessarily have to do the questions, although in some cases they give you additional information that yeah. really helps. Yeah. Kind of like the local questions. Go out there and give it a shot and work through it a little bit. So much of this though, Dave, is just composure. It's the idea of if I just keep my cool. And again, I can figure this out. There is a way to crack it. And that's true of everything. It's true of reading comp. It's true of logical reasoning. It's not just games, although I hate that this is the last time we're going to get to talk about it. Um, I guess the test review will get one more, one more time. Yeah. There's, there's one of the five answers is always right. <laughs> Turns out. So you know it's on the page. It yeah. can be determined. Sometimes that's enough to actually make people feel like, Okay, it's not out of control. It feels like there's an endless number of possibilities. There aren't. No. There's a limited number of solutions that are there to some, you know, in each problem. You you can figure it out. You have to have that confidence. Everybody has panic moments during the test. The, the question isn't whether or not you're going to have those. The question is is how do you grapple with them and overcome them? Let me add one point to that because again, I'm I'm flashing back to experiences that I'm not necessarily proud of on this test. I remember I took a, a test one time and game three, I just couldn't, just couldn't make it work. And so I skipped it. And I went and did game four. And by the time I had finished the fourth game and come back to game three, what I realized were there were two numerical distributions. 
And as soon as I saw that in game three, as soon as I just had this slightly different angle, which took me a minute, took my brain a second to process, it was right there. So available. But it sounds I, like I, the I, Hannah game. I take what it was. I think it was the one about there's like a farmhouse or a wheel house, a mill, something. But it was one of those things where it was like a three, two, one or a two, two, two. But as, as soon as I came back to it, I immediately was like, oh, oh just split it. Do these two. I see. I see the you know distributions I mean? you're talking about. I, started, I thought you were talking about two completely separate. No, frankly, like I said, it's not a flattering recollection because it wasn't actually that hard. <laughs> it just, it was one of those things where I was like, it just you spaced. didn't come. Yeah. Just didn't come to me right away. But instead of me being like, oh God, I'm going to fixate on this and die in this moment. I was just like, I'll see you in a minute. And I went and did something else and came back. And in logic games or reading comprehension, that's a very viable strategy mm -hmm. on, on the big picture. I feel yeah. like, uh, this does not look happy to me. Move on. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And it is again, as soon as I came back, I was like, oh, you dummy. There it is. And I just solved it. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't immediate. And for a lot of people, I think the lack of immediacy is paralyzing and it's kryptonite. doesn't have to be. Nobody likes uncertainty, John. Mm -mm. No, you, you want to have that moment where you feel comfortable all the time. When you start to feel like the floor is sliding away, nobody likes that. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And it's something that everybody deals with in their preparation and many times on the test itself. Not many people go through and feel like every single question just made absolute sense. That's a rarity, not yeah. the norm. So in any event, we're not expecting anything radically unusual. It's just another L set that they're going to use. What you have to show is confidence. Number one, we've talked a little bit about how to make sure you get that. And then number two, if something does go wrong, take a moment. Yeah. See if there's not another way around it. Skip it if you need to. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Sometimes it's like the time invested there is not going to be um, worth it for me. Uh, I should just move on instead. So just think about those things. This is the kind of conversation you need to have internally before the test. So you're like, this is what I want to do. You want to have thought about this. Yeah. This is the visualization this is what you were ideation about portion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you want to have thought about this so that if it does happen, you're not like, what should I do? Instead, you're like, oh, I thought about this before. I'm going to do this. Yeah. I love this. I've heard like, you call this like the Voldemort thing where it's like, you can speak its name. It's it's okay to think about worst case because sure. if you can picture a worst case and see yourself through the other side of it, what do you have to be afraid of? You also know that it won't be worse than that. That's exactly so, right. Exactly. Right. It sets a baseline yeah. that occurs right there. All right. We're almost at the end here. Let's talk about one more thing and then we'll just call it. All right. And this is what I'll say is if you're taking the August LSAT, obviously some of this is going to apply because of the test mentality stuff that we're talking about, but things will change. Uh, I will say though, that if you're using like the new LSAT Bibles, we've posted the new study plans for those that remove all logic games. Those have been up for a bit here. So if you're poking around for them, you can find them. If you can't, email our team at LSAT at powerscore.com. Okay. So with June kind of out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the August test. So if you're taking that exam, obviously you still have a couple more months. You can kind of continue working through things. Some of what you've heard in this conversation, especially about test mentality, is something you should retain for that August test. We'll have updates in the future on cycle changes and things like that. But the one thing I do want to mention is especially a question I've gotten over the last month. Uh, and I tried to answer as many questions as I could while I was gone. I know you did too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was that... Um, you know, especially people using the LSAT Bibles, uh, we changed our study plans for those. Those yeah. are released. They are available on our website. It removes logic games. So if you haven't been able to find those, uh, first off, they are out there. They're in our resource center. And secondly, you can email the team at LSAT at powerscore.com. If you can't find it, they can give you the link for that. But I've had enough questions about like, wait a second, where are those study plans? We have launched a new website. Things have moved around a little bit, so I know it can be difficult to find, but they are there. And, you know, that comes in all the flavors, the one month, the two month, et cetera. All this stuff is there. So I didn't want August people to be left out entirely. 
obviously a little bit less stressful for August test takers this week, unless you're taking both June and August. Uh, and we'll certainly be talking about the August test and our expectations once we get through June. But at yeah. least at this point, that's available. And uh, you can get those on the website, as always, for free. Yeah. I'm going to add one small point to that, which is I've also been getting a lot of questions about whether we're going to do more crystal balls for August and September. And the answer that I've been giving is we have to see what happens in June before we can make any plans for that future. Fair. That is in fact the case. Yeah. Um, let's just put it this way. There's no reason to commit to something yet when we're not really certain. I want to see what happens in June, see yeah. what the test usage is. Um, we do think, and John, you and I have said this before, that a Logic Games free LSAT format is harder to predict. Yeah. It's funny. I'm usually, not, I'm usually so good at commitment. But this, uh, is, <laughs> this is one of those ones where even I'm- That's bad. the funniest thing you said all night, so I do appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. You might be the only one welcome, <laughs> but you're welcome. That's right. Uh, I won't say anything more than what I just what? said, but- yeah, I think um, we'll have to see. I, you and I are anticipating that it could be more difficult. That yeah. may change the nature of the crystal ball in the future. It may eliminate it in the future. I don't really know mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we'll address that after June and try to figure it out at that point. But at least as far as August test takers, at least you guys should have a pretty relaxed week. Just keep on studying, see what happens to the June folks here. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, oversee the demise of Logic Games the very last time it ever goes out the door. Ah, it's so bleak the way you put it, but yeah. What a bummer, huh? It is what it is, John. The world keeps moving on. Time doesn't stop. This is just the reality that we live in. Keeps the thing on that bothers spinning. me the most, Ugh. there will not be any more Logic Game sections released because there's just no point in it. So I'm like, these games that I wanted to see, like the Breweries game. I know. I will not see that Train game. station posters. I really want to do that game. Exactly. This annoys me that I have been teased with this kind of stuff and now... There's no delivery. There's no satisfaction at the end of it all. I think that's wrong. I call upon LSAC to release all former Logic games as a free service to the public <laughs> so that people who had Logic games in the past can come in, take a look at the games they had, and see exactly what happened. Yep. Why not? So that all eight, nice of, us, PR all eight of us nerds them. can go and do... I don't know who the other yeah, six Yeah, I'll tell you, there'll be a lot more than eight of us. I probably... I will say this. It would be a great PR move for them. Uh, something and be appreciated by the public, which means, of course, it won't get done. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> what would you pay? Me? Hmm? $10. $10. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's just my joke response to almost anything. Uh, realistically, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. That's an interesting question. I'd pay, I mean, I would pay nothing. I don't, I don't care about this nearly as much. As I know you do. But if, if I could if pay a hundred bucks and see I, all those I games, would I do it? I would absolutely demand a yeah. copy from you. If, 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 let's say they were like hundred bucks. You can see all the games that haven't been released. hundred bucks. I'd, I'd pay it. Yeah. All right. It's Ooh. not going to happen. So it's, no, you know, this know. is a pipe dream. It's all just a hypothetical. Um, I'm not going to start naming numbers because, well. Don't give them any ideas. I just want to, that's actually what I was okay, just thinking. Okay, what are you doing? I was like, God, what if they hear me say numbers? They might actually oh, do pay it. you pay $1,000? All right, I, there's a new service for four ninety nine, all unreleased games. <laughs> I wonder how they feel about it. I'd really like to know if they're sad inside or whether they're gloating about it or whether they feel like they've made a horrendous mistake, which is what I think they've done. Well, I don't think they're capable of that kind of introspection, but I do think they're probably sad. Because they've got to have this incredible repository that's just getting literally torched, man, bonfired. Well, I mean, they caused this situation. This is I their know. fault ultimately. And uh, they were forced into this position and then they made a decision that I don't think was absolutely necessary and could have been negotiated out, but that's just me. Um, but this is where we're at with this. And so we're, you and I are going to whine and cry about it for a long time. And that's just the way it's going to have to be. So everybody who's listening, we apologize in advance or really for what yeah, just happened i apologize for nothing but all right and on that note if you get a chance please subscribe to this podcast on itunes spotify youtube or anywhere else that you may find it and if you've enjoyed it which might be questionable with tonight's episode <laughs> please leave a comment or rating as well and if you have any questions you can send those to lsat podcast at powerscore.com on behalf of john and myself thanks for listening 
Enjoy the LSAT that's coming up this week. Go out and destroy it to the best of your ability. We wish you the very best of luck. Stay safe out there. Let us know how the test went, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.